We're now talking to Lara Price. Um, Lara, could you give me like some background on your how you got started as a singer? Um, you know, it actually started at the age of six when I took piano lessons from Howard Jones when I was living in England. The Howard Jones? The Howard Jones, yeah. Wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I whoa. remember yeah. him. Yep. Yeah. So he was just, you know, a musician that was playing gigs on the side and teaching, mm -hmm. like a lot of musicians. And um, when we moved back to the States, he went on the tour with the Mix, and that was that was the takeoff of his you know, long career, which he's still touring, by the way. Uh huh. So that's kind of where it started. And then uh, singing-wise, um, I was operatically trained. So um, I did some operatic training at Boise State University. Mm -hmm. And then um, I got into a band at, like, in my 20s when I moved to California. And uh, it kind of started a blues jam just to, like, network and meet musicians. And then, you know, uh, it wasn't supposed to be a blues career, but... <laughs> You know, life happens when you're trying to do something else. Uh -huh. So 25 years later, and like, I'm on my eighth record, um, and then, and I have a DVD out there as well. Um, they all kind of, they're, they all kind of fall under the blues umbrella, which is pretty large. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, 60s soul, some of it's traditional blues, some of it's unplugged blues. Like with the, what I loaded on that stick for you is like, there's an unplugged album. There's kind of like an album that we kind of went through like a government mule phase. Uh -huh. um, the, my my last studio recording was um, like more of a 60s soul vibe. Uh -huh. So uh, moving to Austin um, seven years ago, I knew it would definitely change my music. And I've kind of let all this creativity sing into my DNA. And I'm really excited about what my eighth record is going to bring. Great. From living here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned you were operatically trained. I mean, yeah. what part of that is also applicable to be to singing blues and R&B music? It's all about support. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know, like, if you've heard um, people lose their voice, it's because of they're not singing right or they might be tired or dehydrated. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it kind of, it's like dance. It's like dance. And, you know, ballet is, like, the basis of dance. So mm -hmm. operatic training is great for you if you want to, like, sing for four hours a night, which I've done before. Mm -hmm. um, but it just helps you create um, a, a stable um, place for you to, to a jumping off point for uh -huh. singing. Yeah. So that you don't sing wrong in the incorrect way and hurt your voice. Uh, like what sort of things um, do you have to avoid if you're a singer um, to keep to keep it in shape? I'm not a singer, so I'm just wondering. Um, a lot of things. I mean, rest and water are your best friends. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there's a lot of things that I do that probably aren't good for my voice, but you, you, you scale back on those if you have really a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like smoking, whiskey, all the things that, that, that have to do with rock and roll pretty much are bad for your voice. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yelling, <laughs> talking in a loud bar, horrible. Uh -huh. So, like, if I'm on the road, usually the band will go out and, you know, party, and I will have to stay in and be quiet. <laughs> well, I mean, I read an interview with Judy Collins where she talked about protecting her voice, and the interviewer said, well, that doesn't sound like much fun, but, you know, she's a singer. Yeah. So. I also, I also do workouts. Like, I go to a studio, and I sing for, like, two hours, mm -hmm. two to three times a week, mm -hmm. just myself in a laptop. And just to vocalize, and just like it's a muscle, so you have to keep it trained. So, but it also you also need rest. So, just like anything, like any muscle, you know, you have to give it rest and water. So, and, and I, I was doing some working out last night to get ready for these shows this week. Uh huh. I'm wondering, do you continue to see a voice coach to keep the voice in shape? Yeah, I mean, I actually um, took up a bunch of different voice lessons with different teachers just to get different perspectives mm -hmm. and to, like, refresh on what maybe things that I need to, that I don't know that I'm doing wrong, you know, just different perspectives. I think it's really important to continue learning about singing, and mm -hmm. I, um, you know, had somebody look down my throat to make sure I was didn't have any nodes. <laughs> you know, I was worried. But, yeah, I mean, those, if you do have those things... You have to take care of them mm -hmm. so you don't continue damaging yourself. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you still play the piano? Yeah. Piano, guitar, and drums. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm wondering what drew you act like to blues. What do you think is really appeals to you as a singer at that particular genre? Um, I originally was going after rock and roll mm -hmm. um, as a child of the 80s. So...
to meet musicians, I went to blues jams. And a lot of blues artists aren't one facet. They do play other music as well. So I think that, you know, going to all these blues jams, networking with all these players, that just evolved into a blues career that I didn't intend on happening. I'm glad it did. I mean, it led to, you know, a nomination by the Blues Foundation for Best Female Singer um, alongside, you know, Betty, Betty LaBette. <laughs> I mean, not, not uh, you know, really great company to be in. Um, but, yeah, I just think that it happened kind of by accident. Uh-huh. You know? I'm wondering, um, it seems also that Texas is has a thriving blues community, and it gave the world Janis Joplin. Steve Ray Vaughan. Oh, yes, him too. Yep. Yeah, 100%. You know, upon moving here, I didn't realize how vast the music scene was here. I thought it really was a blues and country-based scene, but after living here for seven years, it is all the music that you want to hear and music that you didn't know that you could hear. It's, it's pretty amazing. My understanding is also that the music scene really looks after its own here. Do you find that's true? Yes. Yep, I do. But I also come from that background as well. Mm-hmm. So I kind of feel, feel like you attract what you give out. Uh-huh. So if you're if you're that kind of person and you and you're all about, you know, supporting other artists, they're gonna support you back. So what are it's your hard. Big- <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta you gotta help each other out. It's hard it's a hard business. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm also a question I you've been compared to singers like Mavis Staples and yeah. Gladys Knight. Which but which who are the singers that really inspired you? Um <clears throat> There's so many. I mean, that's kind of like asking uh, what my favorite food is. I like so much, you know. Um, I mean, comes to mind is like Donny Hathaway. Love him. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently discovered this band called The Darkness. I love them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm all over the place. I mean, you know, lately I've been listening to house music. So it's just, <laughs> singer-wise, I mean, I grew up with Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey as uh-huh. my heroes. Uh-huh. So, I mean, and heart. And Park. And Pat Benatar. So, I like, those Those are the top four, like, growing up. Those are the people that maybe want to be in rock and roll. It's definitely Hart and uh, Pat Benatar, so. I think that was also definitely the decade where you saw a lot of these really powerful female singers. Yeah. Episodes like Annie Lennox and Cindy yep. Lauper, too. Yeah. They, honestly, they didn't resonate with me when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now, you know... As a musician, I totally appreciate you know where they're coming from, but you know the Mavis Staples thing that 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 is a comp- and Gladys Knight that's what a compliment that is to be compared to those people, and I think I just think that um, my well is just a lot deeper, and that's kind of where that possibly comes from. You know, you lived in and you mentioned you lived in England for mm-hmm. five years. Um, a few, like three, yeah. But I was an Air Force brat, so we lived in Alaska, England, Idaho. Uh, my dad traveled a lot, so several states. I'm curious as to that, how that particular background traveling around, you must have been exposed to different music scenes. You know, when you're a kid, you're not really looking at that. I mean, I was pretty young. Mm-hmm. But one thing that it did to help me is it helps me, you know, kind of adjust to any environment. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're having to make new friends every couple of years, uh-huh. you learn really quickly to just adjust. And so that, when that's your normal, um, that's that's kind of, you know, that's what my takeaway from that kind of upbringing is. Musically, though, like my parents, you know, they um, when I was a kid, they sang in church, like Catholic church, so that totally different kind of music than, than what I'm singing now. Um, probably didn't even open my, al- my mouth a bit in church. But, yeah, I don't, you know, the music bug just got me early. Uh-huh. Yeah. I hope you don't mind my asking, but I, from what I've heard, you were originally from Vietnam? Yes, I was born in Vietnam, and I was adopted here in the States. So the government brought me over on a, it's called Operation Baby Lift. And the goal there was to bring all these orphans out of Vietnam, a war-torn country, who might be slaughtered by the VC because they were half American. So fast forward, um, I did a DNA test and found out that I wasn't half American after all, and that I was 100% Southeast Asian, uh-huh. which changed, you know, the vision of who my dad was. So I could stop looking at these Vietnam vets like, is that my dad? <laughs> Are you my dad? Are you my dad? Are you my dad? You know. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Also, um, I'm wondering, 
there have been, there has unfortunately been violence against Asians yeah. recently. Hundred percent. I don't know where COVID came from. Sorry. Oh no, I'm not going to ask you about that. I know. I know. Um, certainly, it was, it was a bad I, joke. <laughs> but certainly, Rock and Roll Globe did a feature about like musicians of Asian descent yeah. and their experience with this. Yeah. COVID was difficult. I definitely had people running from me at the store. And if I'm like, well, you know, the upside is if they're going to stay six feet away from me, then I guess it's okay. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it was heartbreaking to see, you know, Asian Americans getting beat up for no reason. So um, I definitely, as a woman, you're always watching out anyway. And being in Texas, I've definitely had some, you know, microaggression, racist, unfortunate things said to me. And I feel like I just try to, like, not hear that stuff, uh, you know, uh, and, and just make sure I'm safe. But, yeah, it, it's it's scary to, to see it happening. I mean, I have a friend, he's Chinese-American, and he grew up in Chinatown. At one yeah. point, he was, a, like, wary of going back there because of, of that. Yeah, very scary. And, I mean, I saw it in, in happening in Northern California, which is where I moved from. So, um yeah, that was that was that was scary. I, mean, I had somebody here ask me if I was from Shanghai or Shanghai. You know. God. Yeah. So I, I left. Oh man. But yeah, that that stuff does happen, and and uh, you just try not to go to places where you think that might happen to you. I think that with Texas, people forget that it is a very you know diverse. Certainly, places like Austin are yeah. very diverse, and I think cities like. Houston, for instance? Yes. Well, Houston has a huge Vietnamese population. Um, it, it is diverse here in Austin, but it, does, it doesn't take long to be the only Asian person in the room, like three minutes out of Austin. So um, I was actually very used to that growing up because traveling around in, in an Air Force brat situation, you know, living in Idaho, living in England, pretty sure I was the only Vietnamese person in the school. So I thought that by moving here I'd be, I'd be acclimated to that, but once I did and realized that again, I, it's not my favorite. Uh-huh. But when you were in school, like, were you in school with other, like, was the school body, were they mostly white? Were they yeah, kids mostly white. Yeah. Mostly white. A few Asians, maybe. I like them. <laughs> so, Yeah. I am also, I mean, that also reminds me, though, because certainly you have also see a lot of Asian representation. Like, for example, we just had Michelle Yeoh. So great. It, it is great. It's so Oscar. great. I mean, my girlfriends and I were just talking about Barbies and how, you know, they're, my, my particular girlfriend, she's black, and she was talking about black Barbie, right? And I was like, well, there was never an Asian Barbie, you know? I was like, Malibu Barbie was, like, the closest thing that I could. So it's nice. It's, I guess my point is it's nice to see Asian Americans getting some credit, um, getting roles that, that don't include them having to speak broken English or having to say, like, me love you long time. Like, I hate that. You know, we, like... Asians can sing. We don't always do karaoke. I mean, I did a lot of that during COVID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but just to keep my voice up, I'd sing all the songs I want to do. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, sometimes I would load my equipment in and people would ask me if it was karaoke night. And it's like, no, I'm oh, actually... Oh, God. I know, right? Exactly. That was exactly what's happening in my mind. But, you know, you just roll with the punches and you just keep going. You don't let that kind of stuff, like, make you stop doing what you love to do. Mm-hmm. I also, you know, you realize that, and I, that blues and soul always have multi generational appeal. Why do you think that is? Um, maybe because people, you know, relate with pain. You know, everyone's got something going on. Everybody, every generation, every person is going through something. So, you know, that's where blues comes from. It comes from a place of pain. I come from a place of pain, being orphaned by the war. I come from a place of pain, being a survivor of domestic violence, you know? So I think that everyone has something that they're going through every day. It's just how we handle this stuff. And music helps that. Uh It brings us out of that, whether it be happy or sad music. Sometimes sad music brings me out of my sad place. Uh Just to be in sadness, to get out of it. Uh Might sound kind of weird, but... 
maybe I'm just an emotional cutter. <laughs> but, you know, music, it heals people. And, you know, blues-based music, like I said, it comes from a sad place. It doesn't always sound sad, but it comes from a place of pain. Some of the best music, some of the best art comes from pain. And that's why we like it. Because we've all been there uh-huh. in some form. I'm just wondering, I hope you don't mind. You mentioned you're a survivor of domestic violence. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? I've been sure. Idea. We can talk about it. Um, it's, it's new for me to talk about it, um, but I that just says how far I've come in my therapy. <laughs> um, yes, I, I was, you know, I came from a place where, unfortunately, when I was adopted, um, you know, two members of my family, you know, Unfortunately, I dealt with sexual abuse. I'm sorry. Thank you for saying that. Me too, (laughs) you know, but as Jean Quan would say, you know, without that struggle, I wouldn't be who I am right now. Easier said than done, but, you know, it's these these hurdles, some of them really gnarly more than others, are what make me who I am. And so... I just recently came back from California on Sunday, where I've been raising money for Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence for 10 years. And, you know, it's, that's kind of, that's real living to me, is when you can place music in a place where it's going to, one, bring awareness to something that's desperately needed, you know. During COVID, you know, domestic violence calls went up like three, four times what they usually were. So... Playing music and being in a place where I can raise awareness, raise money, and sing with a bunch of women that I love, a sisterhood, which I wish I would have had, um, it's kind of like, that's that's the ultimate. That's really wonderful. Thank you. How were you able to, do you think music was a form of therapy for oh, 100%. You? It's that pain into purpose. And not, without even knowing it, that's what I did. I don't even realizing that that's what I was doing. So I mean, it just it, it makes it fills this hole, this this hole that's going to be always there. Um, and so you just kind of manage it differently, and you manage it with music, you know, or you manage it with exercise, you manage it with people that love you, you manage it with cooking or whatever makes you happy. <laughs> so. Certainly, a lot of people I think of certainly famous people are more open with Me Too to talk about. Like, what were your thoughts on Me Too with the talk about, you know, sexual violence? Well, I think that as women, um, it needs to be said. We deal with a lot um, just walking down the street. So um, I was I was glad that finally somebody spoke up and that we all jumped on board. And you know, it couldn't have been a better thing to jump on board for is women's rights and and how we are treated in the workplace because I can't I'm I'm pretty sure every job I've had every job I've had I've been sexually harassed every job so you know um, whether it be that or you know people's right to abortion you know that's important and right now I feel like I'm going backwards and there's just it feels like an all out assault on women to put us back in our place wherever that 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 place and you know their head is, but it, it, it's, it's unfortunate because I feel like women have made progress in some ways, and, and in some ways, you know, we're going backwards. It's, it's very, um, it's very frustrating. Uh huh. What about um, in Austin and Texas in general? Do you meet women who feel the same way you do about things like reproductive rights or sexual violence? Yes, I think you know, artist-wise. They tend to be more liberal, uh, so yes. But there's a lot of the other as well. I mean, I don't recommend abortion for anybody. I don't recommend doing that. But it is your right to do it. And um, you know, I, I definitely did the women's march, <laughs> and it was awesome to see everybody out. Not just women either, but everybody, all walks of life, all colors, all ages. It's something that needs to be continued to fight. You know, I remember a music critic who described the blues as a great feminist art form. Would you agree with that? I never thought of it as that. Huh. In what way? I think in terms of women singing about their experience in that way. 
you know, I think music could be a catalyst for all of that, mm-hmm. not just the blues. Uh-huh. Um, just in general, mm-hmm. I think women sing about their, their, uh-huh. their problems and their blues, whether the blues is a, a, a house song or a rock song or a jazz mm-hmm. song uh-huh. or a country song. You know, I think that uh-huh. we use music as a vehicle uh-huh. to tell our stories. I, I do know a like blue singers like Bessie Smith or Ma Rainey, I think would be an example of like blue singers really owning their sexuality. Oh, 100%. And how courageous they were to do that. And they didn't, they they probably got a lot of flack for it. I mean, I couldn't even imagine being in their shoes. It had to have been so difficult. And so um, I admire the thick skin. I mean, that takes a lot. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out who I am right now. <laughs> so for them to just own it like that, admirable. I wonder if the blues is something that younger generations keep discovering. I hope they do because it's such a small slice of the music business in general. And um, I feel like a lot of blues musicians, they're either destitute or they're making it. It's, it's tough. Because what you said, like, there are some some younger generations latching on, but not a lot. In fact, like, a lot of my friends, they play in Europe <laughs> to get, you know, any kind of success monetarily. Here, it's, it's you know, it's unfortunate that in America, it's not as respected as it, as it should. And I mean, that's, that was the, you know, that's where rock and roll was born, <laughs> with blues. So, hopefully that thing, that'll, you know, change. Uh-huh. I think with... I mean, crossing over to soul music, you do get artists like, for example, Mark Ronson. Yeah. Who were responsible, or they're gone now, Amy Winehouse and oh, Charles like, Bradley. Yeah, 100%. Um, gosh, my, my student actually is learning Amy Winehouse right now. Mm-hmm. I teach a foster kid um, music lessons every week. It's called Kids in a New Groove, mm-hmm. and it provides uh, music for foster kids. But, um, yeah, she's learning Amy Winehouse, and it's like, she's 12. She loves Amy Winehouse, and I love that she loves Amy Winehouse. So, you know, it's, it's stuff, it's people like Amy Winehouse who have definitely, you know, affected the younger generation. And, you know, I'd love to see another somebody like that come along. We'll see. Um, what, so which singers are you listening to that you really admire right now? Are there any that you can think of? <sighs> I'm just so all over the place. Um, I kind of been going, um, moving towards jazz, and um, I think I listened to Billie Holiday's. Uh, <laughs> uh, what song was that? It was. Uh, oh, my brain isn't working right now because you put me on the spot. You know, I don't. I can't name one particular one. It really depends on the mood. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> like, I just went and saw Jackson Brown last year for the first time. Love him. Um, but I like Sarah Borelli's. I love, like I said, I love Donny Hathaway. Um, I love Sia. Uh-huh. She's got an amazing voice. She does. It's awesome to hear somebody sing like that. Um... That's all I can think of right now. The singer for The Darkness, he's awesome. Justin Luck? Yes! And I follow him. His, his content's awesome. But like I said, I'm a child of the 80s, so all of that music really resonates with me because that's kind of what I grew up with, is that, uh-huh. you know, ripping guitar and, like, awesome vocals. Like, his vocals are crazy. Uh-huh. And if you look at his, his the way he works out, like, he's, he's very healthy, and you uh-huh. have to be. You can't, you know, you have to be physically fit to sing like that. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.